Okay, guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is Tuesday. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And I am here with not just a great magician, but a giant geek. It is, of course, the one and only Tom Crosby. Hey, Tom, how you doing, man? Hello. Uh, I'm good. Yeah, really good. Um, lovely to see your face for the first time in a long, long while. Long time. I'm so excited about having you on the channel. Thank you it's so lovely to be much. Here. Thank you. No. Also, I got really confused because I realised this video comes out at nine o'clock. I was looking at my watch going, it's definitely not nine o'clock. You are <laughs> like, we're, we're five seconds into the video and you're already lying to the audience. It's kind of what I do. It's kind of what I do. Yeah, I'm thinking ahead. I'm batching. Um, <laughs> but you know what? I, I want to I wanna talk to you. There's so much that I want to talk to you about. But I'm going to, I want you to start off by talking to us about how you got into magic because just for the people that don't know who tom crosby is or maybe they've not heard of you before um can you tell us a little bit about how you got into magic would that be okay yeah so uh it's it's a weird one i like i feel like everyone sort of has this fairly same origin story of getting into magic right for me it was an uncle who pulled a coin out from behind my ear you know when i was like three years old um and later find out it wasn't really magic but uh and he he was nobody important um I had, uh, so that's the thing, right? I've, I've had this conversation with a few people. When a, when a young kid is growing up and shows a vague interest in listening to incredible guitar music on the radio, right? The parents can't just let him enjoy the radio, right? Or, or the CD or whatever. The parents have to go, he likes listening to guitar music. We'll get him a guitar, right? And they, and they can't just let him enjoy it, right? And the same thing goes for magicians, right? If a kid shows a vague interest in watching magicians uh, and really enjoys watching magic, and the parents immediately go, we can't let him enjoy this. Let's get him a magic set so he knows how all of it works and it's ruined for him forever, uh, which was me. So I, I ended up getting loads of magic kits. And I was, I, I was into magic to that sort of level for a good number of years. Uh, and then when I was, oh God, teenager, 15, 16, I must have been 16 because I had a job um, working in a uh, working in a theatre. Uh, I was offered some overtime uh, if I was willing to go out into the centre of town. I live in York. City, uh, yeah, you, in the middle of York City Centre, advertising an upcoming show dressed as a nun. Um True story, uh, which I did. And I was into a few little bits, but, you know, I had a, a few DVDs, but I wasn't really part of a magic scene, as it were. And, uh, yeah, went into town dressed as a nun, and I turned around the corner while handing out these flyers with a friend. Uh, we were both dressed as nuns. It was a weird day. And I came across three guys stood on a street corner outside Starbucks um, showing each other card tricks. And I was like, well, this is strange. So I went up and introduced them. And uh, one of them was George Luck, who now helps a uh, big part of Vanishing Ink. Uh, and I don't think any, either of the other two are really part of the scene anymore. But yeah, and we just became really good friends. And uh, and that sort of set me off down a path of joining magic societies and all sorts. Um, so yeah, that's that's my my intro to magic, I suppose. And Same as most people. The time that you came on my radar was when you were performing in the competition, which people can still find on YouTube. And I until I can until I can find out how to access that YouTube account, then it, no one will be able to see it anymore. <laughs> Tell us a bit about that. How did that come back? Because because you you were very young then, and performing at Blackpool is a big deal and also very scary because you know I've done the competition a couple of times. It's not close up. There's hundreds and hundreds of people in the audience and. You know, how did that come about? Was it a bit of a scary moment for you? So, I, you know, I forget how it properly came about. So I, I remember going to Blackpool a couple of times with my mum because I was, you know, 13. <laughs> and, and we went to Blackpool. I think we must have gone like three times together. And then uh, we, we watched the competition and we go to all the lectures and I didn't really socialise with anyone. Right. I, I didn't fully appreciate that Blackpool could be such a big social event. Um, and yeah, I, I forget how it came about that I ended up entering the competition, but I, I applied and I got accepted to the, the junior competition. Uh, and looking back now, there were some damn big names in the, uh, in the, the list. Uh, Stephen Williams Jr. was competing, who is now, you know, big name on the ships. Um, Jack Gledo, who has now given up magic altogether and he's now a, a big stand up comedian. Like he, he's a massive success. Uh, yeah, and you know, just, just really strange. 
Um, and I, I thought I was going along and, you know, I, I wasn't doing anything particularly technical. I was doing stuff that I was performing, you know, that I was just doing um, for the most part. And uh, yeah, and there these other guys were doing, you know, like a perfect false riffle shuffles on the table as part of a Sam the Bellhop routine and producing goldfish and stuff. And Oh, fair play, you know, and I... I I didn't even place, but the review in Abra said that I was really hard done by, which made my day. So that's as much as I can hope for. Awesome. Awesome. Now, now, and, and the, people can see that on YouTube, and I encourage you to for watch now. before he takes it down. Um, link in the description. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with big arrows pointing to it. But so so you're 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 there, you're 15, 16 years old, you're working in a the theater, you go out on the weekend and dress up, and up as nuns. Uh, you go into Blackpool and stuff. Did you then become a professional magician? How did you get from working in a theatre to being a being a pro magician? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I was taking the occasional gig. In fact, I'll tell you what, um, Sean McCree got me my, my first ever paid gig. And it was, you know, it, it was bloody gorgeous. Uh, it was, you know, well out of my league. and But I, it was okay. I, I did all right, I think. Um, yeah, and it just kind of grew from there, really. I somehow fell into being a professional magician which I think it, it's far easier to become a professional magician if you start it from a young age when you don't have any financial commitments um you know I was still living with my mum uh you know so I, I wasn't worrying about rent or bills or anything um whereas now you see people in their 30s with a wife and kids trying to give up a day job in IT trying to become a professional magician suddenly it's a lot a lot more difficult um but yeah I you know I, I started doing weddings and parties and stuff. And it got to the point when I was at college that I was taking so many gigs that it was affecting my, my A-levels or my, you know, B-tech or whatever it was at the time. Yeah. That I, I was having to turn down work and I realized well, I'm, I'm doing these A-levels trying to get a quote proper job in a job that I'm probably not going to enjoy anyway. Um, so I dropped out and, just started doing magic and then I tried again and dropped out again and kept doing magic um but yeah here's the question so you became a, a, a close-up magician and it's fair to say that you were a bit of a, a I don't want to say this in in a negative way a jobbing close-up magician you know you weren't like a John Allen or a you know you know like the 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 people that you see that go out that command 55,000 pounds for a half an hour close-up set you were you were you were one of the guys you were one I was I was working harder not smarter yeah I was I was doing out I was going out doing you know five gigs on the weekend and a couple midweek if I was lucky yeah, I was just running around doing, frankly, the same old magic that everyone else says that they don't do, but actually do. You know, I was doing Invisible Deck, I was doing Sponge Bunnies, I was doing Card to Wallet and Omni Deck and all that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just earning a living from it. I wasn't doing anything revolutionary, but it paid the bills. So, uh, so, so we have that image of that Tom Crosby, the Tom Crosby going out, pockets full of Sponge Bunnies and coins and pens and stuff. And now we have super successful uh, Tom Crosby, who's not even considered a magician. No, no, don't pull the face. I, I wouldn't go that far, but yeah. No, but you, you, no you, let's be honest. And I'm going to tell people that haven't seen you before. You have developed a career and put yourself into a situation where a lot of magicians would wish they could be. You have an agent, you go out on cruises, you get great gigs, you perform on big stages. You've had TV adverts, and we'll talk about this. We've had TV adverts. You, you are... And you you sold out shows everywhere. You are more successful than most magicians will ever hope to be, you know. And I'm not gonna. And I know you're a very unassuming guy, and I'm not gonna allow you to belittle your achievements. You have done so much. I'm and very uncomfortable right now. I know, and I don't care. <laughs> but here's the thing: <laughs> you have you have achieved a lot. How did you get from Sponge Bunny Tom Crosby to? geek magician Tom Crosby, or not even magician, geek Tom Crosby. How did that come about? Did, was it a conscious decision? I'm going to move away from the magic. Where, where, when did you decide that you were going to craft this persona that people know you uh, for now? So uh, I, I've talked about this a couple of times and I, I never feel like I give him enough credit. Matthew Wright. It all comes down to Matthew Wright. Um, so 2011, I was 20 years old 
and I went out to work in Spain at the House of Illusion, Rodney James Piper's Theatre in Salou. And uh, it was, you know, there's nine or ten magicians working there for the summer and you're performing two shows a night, five nights a week, you know, one day off and one day for rehearsals. It is intense um, and it's a lot of fun. It's hard work and you get treated like, what's the, what's the, are we allowed to swear on this? Yeah, totally. Oh, you get treated like shit and the money's worse, right? But it's it's such a learning experience uh, and I'm not selling it, but I cannot recommend it highly enough, right? Everyone everyone not should do it. Big name that have worked with Rodney. Oh, of- yeah, incredible. You know, you get people like Will Houston, Alex Lodge, in spite of that. Uh, th- there are some some really, you know, big names that, are, that Wayne Goodman, I think, um, maybe not got his start there, but certainly you know, worked there for a long while. Tyler Wilson was there, um, but never mind. It was, uh, yeah, just all in all, it was, I I, I liken it to university for magicians. You know, I think it's, there is nowhere quite like it, right? You're working there. I challenge anyone to work there for six months and not get better, right? Because you can't work that often and to paying audiences and not improve. Um, obviously now's a weird time with it being 2020 and you know the world's gone to pot anyway but yeah I if if you're a, a young up and coming magician I cannot recommend it highly enough um, so I worked there and one of the magicians that was working there was Matthew Wright and Matt is in my opinion he's one of the best magicians in the world right? in, in terms of just entertainment value and character and enthusiasm and in choice of effects that he does um, you know, he does he does strong magic, right? People talk about the technical ability, being able to do the trick and the entertainment value. There is a whole third category that never gets addressed and that's being able to choose a good trick, right? If you can do, like it doesn't, if you've got a bad trick, no matter how well you can do it or how well you can perform it, it's still a bad trick. Um, Dave Williamson could get away with it, but that's, you know, exceptions to every rule. Matthew Wright is one of the best magicians in the world and he, really kind of took me under his wing and and we worked on character and developed routines and and ideas uh and then skip forward a few years of me carrying on being a gigging magician but doing more stage stuff um 2015 matt opens his own theater in uh in malaga on the south coast and he asked me if i want to go down and help out and as bad as the money was in salu malaga was worse uh but it was <laughs> But it was great because I was thinking it was going to be a similar setup for the House of Illusion. Um, it's not at all. It's, I mean, marketing wise, it's still fa- marketed fairly similar. It's the Chamber of Secrets in Tara Molinos. And I-, I was expecting there to be half a dozen magicians. No, it was Matt. It was his now wife at the time, fiance and me. And that was it. Just the three of us. And we were doing everything. We were serving drinks. We were selling tickets. We were doing the sound and lights. If uh, at any given time throughout the show, there was one person pouring drinks, one person on stage, and one person doing the sound and lights. If anything ever went wrong, we were in deep trouble. Uh, it was it was a weird experience, but it was it was great. And Matt said to me at the beginning of the summer, he said, "What do you want to get out of this summer?" And I said, with no hint of irony, "I want to get laid," uh, which <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> I was I was fairly recently single at the time and I was out in Spain so we developed this whole act to more or less be please love me right (laughs) in a slightly you know slightly tongue-in-cheek kind of way um and and that was where the act act came from it was more about we realized fairly early on that that you need to be likable right in order for in order for people to fully become endeared to you I don't mean in trying to get laid I mean like trying to endear people to you you need to be likable and you know that's that's what it comes down to um so yeah the the character was born through working with matt and the following year i went and did the edinburgh fringe and the edinburgh fringe just really skyrocketed everything from there so yeah it's all thanks to matt and the fringe i guess so before we before we talk about the fringe a question on that how difficult was it because this is a question i get on the channel a lot to get laid yeah 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 absolutely (laughs) how difficult was it to go from somebody who purely does close-up to somebody who does stage because that's the holy grail for a lot of 
jobbing close-up magicians they want to be on stage you know they want to put themselves together and I think it's really important to do that you know being able to upsell people on having hey yeah I could do close it puts you in another area but I've seen so many close-up magicians that try and take that leap and they die on their ass and they never do it again Absolutely. So, yeah so again it, it's like what I said before like it's far easier to become a professional magician if you don't have any overheads you know if you don't need to worry about finances um, I would say trying to jump from close up to stage is a very similar leap because think of close up as being like a proper job and stage as being like a completely different level because I feel like, and, and I might be wrong on this, this is pure speculation, but I feel like if you build yourself as a close up magician, people will see you as a close up magician. If you build yourself as a stage magician, people will see you as a stage magician. If you build yourself as a magician who does close up and stage, people will see you as a close up magician who also does stage, right? You are still just you are still just a close up magician is is demeaning in a way. I don't mean it to be, but I, I feel like if you want to be seen as a stage magician, you need to stop billing yourself as a close up magician at all, and just be a stage performer. Um, and honestly, if if you want to make the leap do the Edinburgh Fringe. I cannot recommend that highly enough. And it's, it is such a, you know, it's an education. It's, it's a springboard. Um, it, it's, it's everything you could want from it. Um, yeah. Regards, it's, so with regards to the Edinburgh Fringe, now you've brought it mm. up, you've just come back from Tom, Tom Relinos. You've got you, the Chamber of Secrets. You've worked with Matt Wright. You've got this act. You've got the basics of the geek persona at that point, I imagine. So you kind of know, what made you decide to go for the fringe? Was it was it you knew you wanted more and you thought that was going to be your your springboard? What what, what was your internal monologue during that that period of time? Did so uh, I don't Spain and just do close up again, and it was frustrating. Sorry, I just very no. no. Uh, so I I came back from Spain, and when I first came back in 2015, I was still still doing close up gigs because that was what paid, but I'd stopped advertising it. I I just started advertising myself as a as a stage magician, and all of my close up work was referrals or people that knew of me through other gigs that I'd done. You know, but I, I wasn't outwardly marketing it. Um, and I I I so I've been going to the Edinburgh Fringe since I was about sixteen. I I love it absolutely hands down. It's one of it's a monster like nothing else you'll ever you'll ever experience. Uh, monster is the word though, because it is it's grueling, but. Um, I had wanted to do it for a few years. And as it turns out, actually, if I'd gone any earlier, I definitely wouldn't have been ready. But I I was talking about it with Rob James. Um, and Rob has always sort of been a, a big influence of mine, although I'd never tell him that, but he's, you know, significant. Uh, and he said, um, I, I mentioned that about the idea of doing the Fringe because I know that he'd done it before. Uh, and I said, you know, would you recommend it? And he said, do it. Don't think about it. Don't toy with the idea. Just do it. Because if you find an excuse to not do it this year, you'll find an excuse to not do it next year as well. And I mean, this was, uh, he said that it was at the Leamington Day of Magic, which is what, May time, I think. So it was, it was too late to try and get in for that year. But as soon as he said that, I applied for 2016. And I did it. And I did my first year in 2016. Um, and yeah, and I I went and did it. And my first year was, uh, so if, if you don't, I, I mostly talk about the free fringe because that was where I started, but the free fringe, you apply for a venue, they will give you a venue for free, right? For an hour a day. And because it's free, you can't expect it to be great. And I, I got the back room in an, in an Italian restaurant. My backdrop was people having dinner and noisy waiters and a restaurant, you know, and a, a kitchen. Um, it wasn't great, but it was a start and it was a foothold and it was 60 seats and more by good luck than good judgment. I managed to get, you know, most of the time it was full, if not nearly full. Um, so, yeah, that was that's how I started at the Fringe, really. And did you have a strategy going into it? Like, were, were you were you anticipating like because obviously and we'll talk about this, but going to that first Fringe was really the springboard that catapulted you to where you are now. Was yeah. that your end goal or was it just let's see what happens? Because obviously it's a big, I've never done the Edinburgh Fringe, but I did the Brighton Fringe. Mm. It's slightly unusual, which I imagine is similar, but nowhere near as big. 
it's, um, it's on a different scale, but yeah, it's it's a similar setup and a similar premise. It's yeah. kind of like I I must have lost about five grand that 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 Brighton Fringe uh, just in lack of bookings that I had to turn down, let alone paying for my accommodation and and so many other things. It's a big financial decision to make. You know, if you're a professional magician, a did that weigh on your mind? Because I'm, I'm thinking about people that are watching this that are wanting to do the same thing. And they're, they're, they're thinking, well, I can't do that because I'm going to lose so much money from it. What was your end goal from it? You know, is it worth taking that step back to then catapult yourself forward? Is it, what is the, is it guaranteed success? What did you do while you were there to make sure that the right people saw you? You know, that's a lot of questions. So, the, 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 there are four things that you can hope to get from the fringe, right? There is uh, fame, money, uh, contacts, and a show, right? And uh, I, I spoke to numerous people about this and they all said, well, I, I spoke to one person that said, right, you're, you're not gonna get famous from going to the fringe, right? It might happen, but it, one person on a fringe gets famous and there are four and a half thousand shows, right? It's not gonna be you. Uh, money, you're probably not gonna get rich off the fringe because there is not a lot of money in it and it's very expensive to go up in the first place. Contacts, maybe, but everyone's trying to get contacts up there. Um, so don't expect to meet the right people that will catapult you to success. And fourth, uh, a show. Uh, that That is the one thing that you can guarantee that you can get out of the fringe. So then you need to price up how much it's going to cost you to be there for the month. And I think even doing the free fringe, you're looking at at least what, two, three grand just to go up there for the month with marketing and accommodation and hell, just living for the month. You're looking at easily two or three grand and that's without any like paid for marketing. Um, so I went up there fully knowing that, paid for my accommodation, paid for a bit of marketing. You know, I, I, probably, I probably invested about four and a half, five grand in my first year. And I think... If you go look, if you go expecting to not get anything, you'll always be pleasantly surprised. And I think if you go up just focusing on doing a good show, um, yes, you need to market it, but it will it will sell itself better if you have a good product. You know, I it, it, it's hard to explain. I think so. Certainly, when it comes to trying to get noticed up there. Um, you can do your own show, you know, one hour a day, but then there are variety shows and cabarets and, and various things all across the city that you can go and perform in. And people say, you know, it's, oh, it's all about being in the right place at the right time, which feels a bit dismissive. Like, you know, what's the point in trying? It'll happen or it won't, you know, karma's a thing. Um, but actually, I think you can help that you know being in the right place at the right time if you are lots of places all the time right if you're running around like i personally i do seven or eight well five or six shows a day at the fringe including my own um you know doing variety shows just running around left right and center because that way you're performing for 100 people in your audience but also 100 people here 100 people here 100 people there that are looking for different acts and most of those people might just be there to see a show but other people will be there to see a good act that they'll go and see tomorrow you know do their full show or maybe just maybe one of them might be an agent or a producer or a booker or somebody looking for events for their christmas party or possibly even somebody off the telly who wants a new act on mock the week um so yeah it's 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 a weird thing i think when it comes to the fringe I was going to say working harder will always get you success. That's not necessarily true because I know a lot of people that have worked really hard. Um, there's a double act up there called Griffin and Jones uh, who do Brighton Fringe as well, um, who are two of the hardest working magicians in at the Fringe. And they have easily one of my favourite shows at the Fringe as well. Um, and, and they work their backsides off all month, every single year they go up there. Um, and and they frankly deserve a lot more success than, than they're currently sat on. Um, so it doesn't always equate, but I think the people that work hard and the people that go up with a good show, um, they're normally the ones who do quite well.
Sorry, it's a very ranty way of answering that. No, no, no. Question. I, 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 yeah, I completely understand. Well, it's it's the same formula, isn't it? In life, you know, you put you get what you put into it. You know, if you if you're going to work hard and you're going to put 100 percent in, then you know you'll you'll eventually good things will happen. So, so. At, at the end of the fringe, then, so you've done the fringe. Did was did you meet an agent there? Did you was was so uh, in my in my first year, I got bookings off of it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I got various bits of work between then and the following August. Um, the following year, uh, a producer came to see my show and he really enjoyed it and he wanted to represent me and, uh, you know, wanted to take my show up there the following year. Um, there was also an agent uh, off the cruise ships that came along and wanted to snap me up and start me working on the ships which is where that came from. And I've been working on the ships solidly ever since, up until March. Um, so yeah, that, that that was where more work came from. Um, um, you mustn't get me wrong, like I'm still, I'm not famous. I'm, this sounds slightly big headed. I'm a little bit fringe famous in the same way that you can be famous in the magic world, but not famous in the real world. I'm a little bit famous in the fringe circle just because i do so many variety shows and i've worked with you know five or six new acts every day and met most of the cabaret circuit yeah um and i think i'm almost the whore of the variety show circuit in the fringe because you know by being everywhere lots more people see you which gives you more chance to sell your own tickets etc so it's this self-fulfilling you know you work hard you get people in um so yeah i got uh, I got the cruises off the fringe and then this year went back and actually I was going to say I made a profit. I've made a profit touch wood every year. Um, but I also know that I'm in the tiny minority. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a guarantee. Although in spite of that, if it's something that you can afford to do, I would recommend that everyone does the fringe at some point. Um, it is, it is such an experience and it will give you a show. So, very briefly, let's talk about the. Um, actually, before I, yeah, let's talk about the cruise liners that you do because uh, the cruise uh, because the ships that you go on, as you say, you've been doing those solidly for a long time now. That's the holy grail for a lot of a lot of magicians and entertainers. It's one of the only places where you can have a stage that you can regularly perform on. Um, it, it, a lot of people say, "How do I get on the ships? How do I get on the ships?" and is, is there any advice that you can offer on that? I know you kind of went down the fringe route. Is there is there any other advice you can offer and how to um, do this? I think certainly one of the biggest things I could say is make sure that your show is ship ready um, before you start trying to get on the ships. Um, because it, it you mustn't get me wrong. I know a lot of the big illusion acts that, that do the ships that will be flown out with a shipping containers worth of illusions that they're performing for two weeks and then get off and do another ship. Um, but most of the acts on the, on the ship circuit, they are traveling acts that are going from one ship to another, to another, to another, you know, they're just doing back and forth. Not so much anymore. I realize the regulations have changed and the CDC's announced a new thing with cruise ships yesterday. Anyway, not important. Uh, it's, you know, I think it's, it's very important to have an act. I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. When you're being flown around, you're being flown around with two standard size suitcases. So you need to make sure that your entire act fits into two 20 kilo suitcases uh, and hand luggage. Um, also, make sure your act is completely clean because it's far easier to get booked. If you're not swearing, you can still do an adult show. If you are swearing, you can't do a family show. Yeah. Right. So make sure you're squeaky clean make sure your act fits into two suitcases and make sure you have enough material you need um typically for the cruises you need two 45 minute shows and some cruise lines will want an extra 10 minutes out of you for a farewell gala show um so yeah two tight 45s uh, that are squeaky clean fit into two suitcases and an extra 10 minutes and if you can offer something extra as well that always goes down a treat and will make you look more appealing and more, more sellable so i mean like a lecture or a q a i, I do a, a talk on how to improve your memory and stuff like that just as an extra little something to sell a little something to tack on the end okay that's very very cool 
And, and one last question on, um, on, on, on this whole process that you've been through. People now don't identify you as a magician. Even though that you do magic in your show or, or you do elements of magic, yes. how did that come about? How did, how did I mean? Obviously, you've gone through how you went here and you went here and you've developed this persona over time. But when did you decide to completely separate yourself from the label magician? You know, and how did you pull that off in terms of the act? That was Matt in 2015, um, because uh, which is why I give him so much credit for it all because he he was the one that suggested it. So I, I, I do this thing. And in fact, it happens to be mentioned on a DVD that you and I put out in 2012. Um, I forget the company, but it was a, uh, a DVD on which, yeah, it, using a memorized deck, um, somebody names a card and then I just dead cut to the card. Like it's nothing particularly fancy. You're basically doing what you say you're doing, right? I've memorized this pack of cards, name a card. It's that one, 32 cards down, right? And, you know, th there isn't really a trick to it. It's just a feel thing. And Matt was obsessed with this trick. And, you know, the first time I met Matt, actually, at Blackpool a few years before, um, he had beckoned me over to his table to go and just show, show people this over and over again when I was, like, God, 19, 18, something like that. Um, yeah, so, so Matt loved this trick. And when we got talking about it, and I performed it on stage at the Chamber of Secrets, Matt's place in Malaga, and... He uh, and the audience thought it was pretty cool, but it was clearly a trick. And then the following night, I went out and on Matt's suggestion, went out and explained exactly what I was doing. Right. No trick. Here is a pack of cards. I have memorized this pack of cards. Name a card. Eight of diamonds. Right. That is 28 cards from the top of the deck there. Right. And everyone was like, holy, that is incredible. Like, a whole different level of reaction because they realized the effort that went into it. And Matt and I turned around and went, hmm, that's really interesting. Uh, I reckon we can build an entire show out of that. So that was where the character came from. Um, and now my show is more and more doing stuff for real. Like there is still some stuff in there that I'm claiming is real that is using magical methods, shall we say, but more and more of the show is now it's now being done for real um so yeah and and as i say the reactions you get from it are just a completely different level because people aren't enjoying it as a trick they are appreciating it as a skill um which actually I, we didn't fully explain what my show is my show now is just a collection of skills um even if some of those might be accomplished with the aid of some magical methods it is just skill based and people hopefully leave the show thinking that most if not all of it is 100 percent legit mm. it's and amazing yeah oh bless you it's it's a very different feel like it's got a very different atmosphere people would go to your show and not even think they're seeing magic no and i i i start the show by saying i'm not a magician you know and i mention it a couple of times throughout like what you're about to see looks like a magic trick it's not here's what i'm doing um in fact this organically shall i shall i demonstrate with a rubik's cube yes, please do, please do. Uh, i do worry this is going to pick up really badly on the microphone because the rubik's cube sound is horrendous at the best of times uh so uh the moment for instance, this Rubik's Cube looks like it's mixed up, but it is not. I'm in full control of the cube, and I can tell you that currently uh, this cube, for instance, is 17 moves away from being solved. Uh, if I do this, uh, it puts it down to seven moves away, and I know what those seven moves are, and if I can do it quickly enough, it looks, frankly, as I say, it looks a bit like a magic trick. Not a magic trick, just a lot of free time. I'm going to do five moves in this hand, throw it into this hand, do the last two moves as it lands, and I think it looks pretty cool. Just don't blink. Wow. That's it. That's so basically the entire show is just that dragged out for an hour. Uh, it's excruciating, but that's, but th that's what I mean by, by demonstrating things as, as a skill. Um, although to be fair, you and I both know that that is just exactly yeah. what I say I'm doing. So it's, yeah. you know, that's one of the legitimate things I was talking about. Although we also know magicians that would present that as magic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the reactions you get from doing it for real are just a, a completely different level. So is it, of course, I know that you're constantly working on new shows, like every year you do a different
different show at the Edinburgh Fringe. When you're working with cruise liners, they're always wanting to see something new. They're always wanting to see something different because of people that come back every year. They get such repeat customers, yeah. So my question is, now you've severely limited yourself in terms of effects that you can do. 99% I've very much shot myself in the foot. Yeah. So how, you know, it's a question that comes up on this channel all the time. How do you select tricks for yourself? What's the best tricks to get for your character? It's even worse for you because you have to look for stuff that's not even a trick that you can adapt. Severely, yeah. I'm I'm very much limited. Um, Yeah, it's it's a weird one. I've... uh, very much read, made a rough from my own back with that one. Um, although it makes going to conventions a lot cheaper because I can wander around the dealer's hall, look at all these incredible tricks that are being performed, uh, being performed at me in the dealer's hall more often than not. And I will go, that is an incredible trick. I will never do it. Uh, and like, I can be far more honest with myself. I know a lot of magicians that go, I like that trick. I could, I could do that. I could, I could put that in my act. It's like, you are lying to yourself. You're never going to do it. Um, but the, the problem is that even once I've explained it to magicians, even after magicians have seen my show, I can ask for advice and they still don't get it. Right. Uh, I, there's um, Kieran Johnson. I love him to bits. One of my favourite people in the world. But every time I talk to him, he will show me a trick and go, you could do that in your show. It's like, no, it's it's a magic trick. And it's like, yeah, but you could present it as like a, a, a pseudo hypnosis thing. And it's like, that's not a skill. <laughs> that's that's pseudo hypnosis. You're f- branching very much onto mentalism there. Yeah, yeah. But but what what about like a, a going back in time premise? And it's like you you're very much missing the point, Kieran. Uh, <laughs> and which you know I totally understand. It's it's it is a very weird concept, which means it, well, it, the it only is such a struggle. That's ever done something like this, which is why you're so popular, I imagine, because it is very unique. Yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of magicians that you know. I'm thinking obviously at the fringe but there are lots of magicians up there doing magic shows there's only one of me whatever i am the only person i can think of that kind of is in a similar vein but not really is charlie fry yeah yeah he, he's a, he's a great example um but yeah even charlie will have a juggling section of the show and then have a, a magic section um yeah it, it's uh, yeah he, he's a great example actually i've never compared myself nor would i like to compare myself to Charlie Fry because that is not a favourable comparison to anyone. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he's rather excellent at it. But as you say, it, it, it really severely limits my options. Um, so rather than going out up to the fringe every year with a completely new show, I think of it as an evolving show. So there are elements of the show that I did this year, uh, sorry, last year, just gone 2019, uh, that were in my show in 2016, first time I did the fringe, and hell, even 2015 when I was doing Matt's show. Um, so the, there are still elements in it and still actually one routine that is kind of my go-to. In fact, that thing I just performed uh, was born at Matt's show and has been in every single show since. Uh, but the shows have very different feels because one thing that magicians don't touch on very often is the show needs to be about something bigger than the magic, right? It needs to be, needs to be about something else. So in, in my, my most recent show was about Alan Turing, um, the creator of the computer, in essence, back in uh, in the 40s. Um, and it was just, you have, having that framework means that you can do the same trick year on year with a different setting um, or a, the same routine in a different environment makes it feel a bit different. Um, how I create new material is a very difficult question. I'm trying to identify that for myself at the moment, and I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's it's more more or less thinking and and listing what my character can do, um, because that's the thing. Given all the practice in the world, right? If you, if you could practice for a hundred years nonstop, you would still never be able to turn a pack of cards into a solid block of plastic. No. Right. That is a magic trick. Right. And, you know, if you practiced for 100 years, you could never restore a piece of rope that you just cut in half. Um, so it, it's trying to find things that you could do with a skill if you were given enough time. Um, and my realization now more and more is I'm just going to have to learn these skills. You know, if, if I want to be able to give the impression that I have memorized the phone book, I'm just going to have to memorize the phone book. I'm not trying to memorize the phone book, but that's that's the idea. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, it's it is getting more and more difficult. Um, but I like the challenge, and it's a nice project, especially over lockdown. It's been fun. And you are committed to your character, like you were telling me off camera before we started. <laughs> that you've learned code. You've learned computer coding. Yeah. Just because it's the sort of thing you'd expect your character to do. Yeah, uh, I mentioned mentioned this to you before we started. Um, Garrett Thomas, who is a uh, a great friend and a massive influence on on me, and I'm sure many others. Uh, he he came to stay with me a few years ago, and we went to a bar, and he started playing darts with some random guy in the bar and Garrett is incredible at darts it turns out he's also incredible at pool uh because and I said you know when did you learn all this and he said if you met somebody that could do magic and then you found out that they couldn't shoot pool and they couldn't throw darts and they couldn't solve a Rubik's cube that would be weird and I went, yeah that is a good point that you know because you're claiming to have these superhuman abilities but you can't do something fairly bog standard um so uh i thought right i'm claiming to be the biggest nerd in the world how weird would that be if i couldn't code an app or you know or or i don't know have a an ungodly collection of board games and you know compete in Pokemon tournaments and you know like all these things that don't get me wrong I'm very much into anyway you know learning to code and something I've wanted to do for a while but the fact it happens to fit with the character is just a nice little bonus so yeah and here's a question for you uh, on the subject of trick selection I've known you for a long time and one thing that I've always believed is that you love magic. I mean, I remember when I, you know, we spent hours at Blackpool and you would be, I remember that thing you used to do where you, uh, you'd be going around the Ruskin with a pen and a card. And oh, yeah. uh, it'd be like, show me, you know, uh, something about, did you see the pen disappear? And you turn it was, the So uh, it was, I, I, I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I can't do it. I don't have a pen to hand, but um, yeah, blank card, Sharpie, take the cap off. Uh, write something on the card, put the cap back on the pen, turn it round, and the card says, there is no pen. And they look back at this hand and the pen's just gone. Um, which is a really fun moment. Um, or uh, what was it one we played with was, uh, right, oh, I think, this was, was this me and Garrett? I forget. Uh, writing something on the card, uh, you know, oh, that's handing them the cap. You put the cap back on the pen uh, and then you turn the card round and it says, there is no spoon. And you're no longer holding the pen and it's a spoon uh <laughs> which was just a really surreal moment but it was a lot of fun yeah um, but you you and you were doing that just for fun because you love magic now i love it you've talked about going around dealers and it's a lot of a cheaper experience now but do you still read magic practice magic you know you're never going to perform it Oh, absolutely. You're so well read. You know, I remember the first time we met and you were like, I'm like, there's this 17, 18 year old kid and he knows, he's just like, oh yeah, I'm friends with Garrett Thomas. I'm friends with Pitt Hartling. I'm friends with, I'm like, how does this kid know everybody? <laughs> that like, I wouldn't even dream of like emailing them and this guy knows everyone. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Oh God, no, no, it was, um, oh, I, I, I certainly wouldn't say I was friends with him at that point. Uh, I mean, I am now through different connections, but um, yeah, I just, I was obsessed with magic from, from such a young age uh, that I, I thought, right, if you want to be a magician, you need to read every book that you, there is going. So that was what I tried to do. And I tried to learn and I, I, you know, I, I, put, I feel like crediting is important, right? I feel like knowing where, like we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? I wouldn't be doing what I do if Rick Merrill didn't do what he did and he wouldn't be doing it if Rune Clan wasn't doing it. And I mean, that goes back to Flip Palima, but you know what I mean? It, it's, you're standing on like, everything that you're doing is based on something else. And I think credit where credit is due, um, it's very easy to start coming up with things that you think are original if you don't know where they came from. Um, there is a one of my favorite examples was red uh oh red by bob king uh yes no uh <laughs> I, I wasn't going to mention that it definitely was but uh no uh, so i went to see a lecture last year and somebody was doing a a coin trick it was a copper silver coin trick and the guy that was lecturing um and to be careful what i say uh wasn't necessarily the most knowledgeable uh is the nicest way i can think to put it 
uh, he did a copper silver routine and then explained that while teaching it, that it was based on Chad Long's flash. Huh? Yeah. So my problem with that is, and this is only through crediting, right? This copper silver routine is based on flash by Chad Long. Flash by Chad Long is based on color changing knives by Joe Mogar. Yeah, Mogar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and color changing knives was based on copper silver. <laughs> So this is a cycle of crediting. And if he'd known that, if he'd looked into the, the crediting of where it came from, he would understand that the routine he's doing is the routine that was based on the routine that was, you know. Yeah. yeah so I, I feel like crediting is fairly important like that. Um, uh, and not, another thing happened similar to that recently, and I forget what it was. Not important. But yeah, I, I'm just, I'm obsessed with magic. While I don't perform it, at least not professionally. I still do it occasionally, just around the table, you know, sat with with friends and um yeah, but I I, I think my big problem oh, I, I think like it's not the be all and end all, but I I think it's fairly important because some of these people that created magic tricks over the years, they deserve our respect. And you know, they deserve respect for creating the effects, not necessarily for anything else they did, but yeah, they I think it I, I personally think it's important. And to be honest, you can end up basing routines on effects from years gone by that are completely, you know, completely unnoticed. I forget who was said that if you want to keep an effect secret, publish it in a magic magazine. Um, I've got a, a massive box full of uh, Abra going back to God knows when. Um, and you look in there and there are some incredible tricks, you know, by some big names as well. There is some rubbish and it's, you know, a lot of sifting through, but yeah, there you go. What I got from that whole thing, by the way, is Tom Crosby for the first time ever in his life saying, I need to be careful what I say here. That was, that, that I might soundbite that and put that on as a gif or something. No, but... it's it's because the person that was lecturing was a very, he's, he is a friend. <laughs> no, okay. I, I have a theory, right? When it, when it comes to magicians, right? There are, uh, there are sort of two different axes, right? Mm -hmm. You can be a bad magician and a very good magician, right? Along this axis. Also, you can be a you can be a, a dickhead and you can be a really nice guy. If you are a dickhead with a good act, I will watch your act, but don't ask me to hang out with you. If you're a nice guy with a bad act, I will hang out with you, but please don't ask me to watch anything you're going to show me. Similarly, like, and I think various people are scattered across across that grid. Um, and I will, you know, if you're on, if you're on the nice guy side of the grid, I will absolutely hang out with you. If you're on the dickhead side, I, you know, I don't have time for you. Um, and oh, wait, now I know guy, what you've always said, yeah, let's hang out, but you've never wanted to watch a magic trick. I get it now. I, I understand. It's cool. I've seen Slim. <laughs> um, I tell a lie. There is actually a really good trick on Slim that I, I keep going to every now and again, but that's by the by. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, but that's the thing, and I think it's very important to be able to distinguish between the two. Um, and and this this guy is someone that I get on with very well, uh, and he's he's a lovely fella. But best magician in the world, he ain't. <laughs> yeah. So. so let's talk about creating magic tricks to sell, because at one point you were creating a lot of magic tricks, and you don't do that anymore now. The first trick you ever bought out, I think, was the Shadow Stack recall. Mm. Yeah. Um, with uh, I forget some other such company. I don't know. Um, <laughs> then, then you bought a load of stuff out through Matt Wright's company, the Pencyclopedia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pencyclopedia. memory and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so my question is, why don't you create magic anymore? Why don't you create magic to sell? Why don't you lecture? I remember seeing your lecture and it was an amazing lecture. I still have and do your book test that was based on oh, the nice. book test. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you were, you were and are, and you still are a very creative guy. How come you don't release magic anymore? How come um, you don't? So I'm, I, I still lecture, still available for online lectures uh, with all magic clubs worldwide. Uh, no, but I, I, you know, I still happy to lecture and still, but nowadays my lecture is more focused around my show and doing stuff on stage. Um, the the close-ups, partly because I don't feel like I'm in a position where I have any right to lecture on close-up stuff because I'm not doing it. I'm not performing it. I'm not actively trying to create new new stuff. And if I was actively creating new close-up stuff it would purely be to sell 
and ethically i'm not massively comfortable with that um i i don't like the idea of selling creating things purely to sell um yeah i I'm, I'm not coming up with, like i know plenty of magicians that are coming up with new tricks because the rent's due you know and and that's the only reason they're doing it um and well, let's be honest. Say, let's call a, a spade a spade. Somebody like Jay Sankey, who is an incredibly creative sure. guy, but has literally no filter. You know, he just no, a- absolutely. Um, oh yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, I think half the magic you see coming up on on the brand new on Murphy's these days is here is something for the sake of selling it. Um, which, yeah, is is not the sort of market I want to get into. But also an I, I might be doing a disservice to certain people here. I feel like if you create something and it is good enough to sell, why would you want to sell it, right? Surely that's the sort of thing that you would want to keep to yourself and go out and perform. It's probably different in the in the close-up world, but certainly in, in the stage world, like it's, it's such a small world that people are going to see more than one act at some point. Um, yeah, it, it, it's strange. If if it's good enough to sell, why would you sell it? And if it's not good enough to sell, why would you sell it? I suppose the one argument is because if you don't, somebody else will. <clears throat> Finale of Tom Crosby's uh, uh, stage show. <clears throat> Just saying. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, that, that, but there's an example. That's something that you've created for your show. You've closed your show with it for six years. Um, and and now, is it Bondley um, is bringing out something that is... Uncomfortably similar, shall we say. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a strange one. Um, I mean, I can tell you for sure he is he's using a different method to what I'm using. Um yeah, it's it's strange. Um and this sort of applies to all Rubik's Cube magic. I feel like it doesn't suit most people. Right? It it's not the sort of thing that most people will will I think not the sort of thing that most people will perform. Most people that want to perform it will try it at least once. Whether or not it works, very different matter. Um, But yeah, I think a lot of people will try it and find out it doesn't suit them, which is the only thing that's stopping me from going completely insane that other people are releasing similar stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But also I feel like, uh, particularly when it comes to my finale or, or Bond Lee's thing, if Bond Lee's thing does become popular and everyone starts doing it and it does become wildly successful, that's fine. I just need to up my game and change my finale and start doing different stuff. Um, which a great attitude to have. Uh, I mean, it's we were talking about this before we started as well. When it comes to the lockdown, any fool can be uncomfortable, right? I can sit here and I can moan and whine and say, how dare he? He's ripped off my thing. He might not have done. It might be completely independent creation and there'll be lots more products like that coming out in the future. And he just wanted to rush his to be out first and whatever. I can sit here and complain or I can go, right, what what can I do about it that's beneficial for me? Right, I need to do something that's going to be beneficial for me. And, you know, here's the thing, right? His Kickstarter campaign has already been fully funded. Right. If I go on there and just start going, you've ripped off my thing, he can't take it down now. It's too late. The money's already been pledged. Right. And I, that's only going to get me worked up and at, at best lose me a potential friend in Bondley. At worst, really piss off Bondley uh, to the point where he doubles down and makes a big marketing campaign about it. Yeah. So I'm just going to get on with my, you know, get on with it. My, my act is different enough i think um yeah and i just need to keep working at it and and keep keep improving and pushing it to the point that i'm so far ahead in the race that copycats can't catch up but i mean that's an amazing attitude to have i mean you know you mentioned lockdown so you know the thing is you and i both know of several magicians that have handled lockdown very very badly they're depressed they're obsessed Uh, some have quit completely never intending to come back again you have you know worked on your act you've developed stuff you've had this very positive attitude of you know when things can come back I'm going to be ready to go you've got yourself uh, another thing that you're doing you know which is allowing you as a performer to still shine in a completely different way you know as a as a you know as a DJ which is which is amazing and opens up more doors I prefer the term radio presenter 
sorry, radio presenter. Um, <laughs> no, but it four doors, it? no, that's the thing that you can put on your CV that looks great. You know, I've been a yeah. radio presenter. You, know, you, you, you've handled this brilliantly compared to so many. I, people. You, you say that it, it's, it's really difficult, of course. And you know, we, we live in a world of social media, and the facade that we see from everyone is just that right it's a facade you're, you're only seeing what people want you to see and i know plenty of friends that are far more open about their mental health than than others on social media and you know good for them but that's that's not me and i've god knows i've had I, I, there was one point at lockdown where i was i was ill not covid thankfully but um i was i was really unwell and i was having a really rough time of it and my mental health really took a proper nosedive. Um, but I bounced back from it. And we are, you know, we, we're, we're here now. Um, and uh, as I said, I think anybody can be uncomfortable if they want to be. You know, you're more than welcome to sit there and moan about the state of the world and where we're going to be in six months or four months or three months or, you know, end of November or whatever. But it's still, it's not going to change anything. We're still going to be in this boat and we're all in it together and the sooner and god i'm sound like a government propaganda campaign here the sooner we all get on board and we just knuckle down and keep ourselves to ourselves for four weeks the sooner we can all get back to normal or whatever yeah. normal is these days yeah so. totally agree right i want to ask you a couple more things very quickly and uh i'll try not to trigger you asking this question um because it's a question i get on the channel an awful lot and you are uniquely um, the person to ask about this. I have so many people saying, where can they learn how to do Rubik's Cube magic? Now, I know the irony of me asking this after you just said that most magicians don't suit Rubik's Cube magic. And I'll try not to use the, the words cube and three in the same sentence, because I know that's going to make you go off one. But let's, how, what, have you got any advice on Rubik's Cube magic and that sort of thing? Um, funnily enough, Craig, you are a huge influence on me. Uh, for better or for worse. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, right before, well, about an hour before we started recording this call, I put a thing up on Facebook. Um, and I have just, because uh, for people just tuning in, uh, Craig and I had a conversation a couple of days ago when we were arranging this interview and asked me if I wouldn't mind trying to teach uh, young master Ryland uh, or help him improve with his Rubik's Cube. Yeah. And it's something I've thought about doing in the past, but never really like took any steps towards uh, anyway i'm now offering workshops uh so there you go i've put up a little uh amazing little, little poster all inspired by you my friend so uh, well, so yeah well, Ryland, there you go. Just super little... excited to be starting his lessons <laughs> very I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well it's gonna be fun um but yeah so I, I figured enough people have been asking me about it over the years excuse me <laughs> hard water um that i I've, I've ended up doing, you know, little 15, 20 minute videos here and there that I've put up on private links on YouTube or trying to talk people through it on Facebook. And I thought, you know what, it'll be far more beneficial just taking a couple of hours doing like this, like a face to face thing. And um, here's the thing. You can absolutely learn everything with the Rubik's Cube on YouTube. Right. Go ahead. Right. A couple of um, there is a guy called Crazy Bad Cuba who is well worth looking out for. His name is Dan. Um, Sio the King, C-Y-O, the King, uh, or one word. Uh, BadMephisto.com. There are loads of different websites and YouTube uh, series that will absolutely teach you everything you need to know. That being said, I think there's an awful lot to be said for having like a one on one tuition and having that instant feedback and being told where you're going wrong. Um, so, yeah. Uh, there are some YouTube links if you want to check them out and highly recommend that you do. But also, I'm available for personal tuition if that's something you're interested in. I was going to say, Ryland is his first customer. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is true. I've got to the point where Ryland, I can't teach Ryland anymore. He wants to learn more. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I don't know. I can't help you any more than what I have. So yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. Tom. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So cool. Okay, so that's... And, and you know, <laughs> I find it funny that so many magicians go... I bought this Rubik's Cube. I bought Venom Cube. I bought Venom Cube. Hmm. I don't know how to solve Rubik's Cube. <laughs> you know, and they yep. surely if you're going to do cube magic, you have to at least be able to solve a Rubik's Cube, right? It's So it's a problem that, that you see quite a lot. All right, I, here, is, here is my impression of many magicians you'll see at a Magic Society competition. Hi, uh, I'm, I am a sleight of hand expert, and here is 
here is a gambling demonstration right and it's like you're you're definitely not right you are definitely not a sleight of hand expert and i'm not believing that for a second um the same thing comes to the rubik's cube i think you can tell just by looking at how somebody handles a rubik's cube whether they're good with it or not mm. right whether they know what they're doing and you know what maybe if you know if uh, don't worry, i'm presenting it as a skill so i need to give off the air that i know what i'm doing um for certain people if you're doing it as a magic trick maybe not being able to solve the rubik's cube is beneficial right you know because for things like venom cube that for the most part don't require any certain levels of skill um maybe that is the impression you want to give off so as i say maybe it is beneficial to not be able to actually solve a rubik's cube um but yeah, I, I always think it's valuable, especially, you know, in case something gets lost, you don't want to be sat there with an app trying to go, right, the red one's there and blue, you know, and it's just nightmare. So yeah, I, I would say it's well worth learning, um, especially because anyone can learn in an afternoon if they're so inclined. Well, so, you know, I do some Rubik's Cube magic and there's nothing, I don't do restaurants anymore, but there's nothing more magical than you going have a tattoo, to don't a restaurant. Huh? You have a tattoo, don't you? Yes, yes, I, I have a tattoo. It's not the uh, not the greatest tattoo, as you pointed out to me, but it's a tattoo. <laughs> the bank story there. Uh, I caught Craig on a bad, de bad day a couple of years ago when he put up a picture of his new tattoo. And uh, I pointed out to him that that Rubik's Cube uh, is the setup from Stephen Brundage's DVD. Uh, there you are. Uh, and it's specifically two sides of the cube that Stephen says you should never show the audience. Uh, Craig blocked me for about a year on Facebook after that. <laughs> but you're right, and it pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, sorry. You call me. We are the friends now. A very bad year, and I will <laughs> formally apologise and say I shouldn't have blocked you. <laughs> it's uh, on the record. Don't worry. You're, yeah, you call, you, call me on a, you call me on a bad. You call me on a very bad day. What was that? What, what was that all about? If you're not careful, I'm going to start bringing up Stephen Brundage in a second. Um, <laughs> And World Magic Shop and everything else that I know triggers you. Who? Um, <laughs> what? Well, I can't even remember what I was saying. I was talking about something. I can't even remember. Uh, uh, you, you, you do a bit of Rubik's Cube stuff. Oh, yeah, I do a bit of Rubik's Cube stuff. There's nothing more magical than when you go into a restaurant and it's just a kid there with a Rubik's Cube, which happens more than you'd know. And you just go and pick it up and you just solve it for them and put it down. End of. There is not it's a magic trick that you can do at that point that is more magical for that family right there than what you've just done. End of. Are you, are you saying that demonstrating an actual skill is more is uh, more impressive and gets better reactions than doing magic? Absolutely. Welcome to Absolutely. my world. Um, but yeah, so here's the thing, right? So I, I've gotten to the point now, especially at the fringe, not so much on the cruises, admittedly, because it's a different demographic. Um, but I've gotten to the point on the fringe where I know my target audience and I am attracting the right crowd so that it gets to the point when I first get a Rubik's Cube out of my case, I can say to them, this is my Rubik's Cube. Does anyone in the room have a Rubik's Cube that I can borrow? <laughs> and <laughs> about 50% of the time, it hits and Brilliant. that's so cool um because first of all right it's like the idea of using a borrowed rubik's cube for this routine is just wild <laughs> just <laughs> such a mental concept to me um but also if it's somebody that's carrying a rubik's cube around with them it's probably going to be someone that knows what they're doing it's probably going to be quite a good cube um so you don't need to worry about it being a legitimate rubik's cube and you're trying to twist it you know you can still do all the you know fancy finger flicking stuff um but yeah and it also like it shows to the audience straight away that this is a normal rubik's cube right there is nothing tricky or fishy um i'm not going to switch it uh you know it, it's it's just so many added bonuses i wish it could happen more often uh but when it does my god it's strong um right. yeah just a really cool moment so now on the subject of something else before we wrap up I would be remiss to ask you another question I get on the channel all the time. I get, because I do a lot of Memdeck magic, mainly thanks to you. And a lot of people ask me, how do you learn how to solve a Ruby? Uh, no, Ruby. How do you memorize uh, the stack? Memorize deck. Now, last week, um, I'm, I'm doing this in the timeline. I know when your interview is coming out. Two interviews before you, I interviewed Matt Baker hmm. from the uh, yeah. Shuffle Club, and he, he talked about Memdeck magic. Um, I remember when we filmed Recall, hmm. you told me at the time you knew six different stacks or five different stacks. 
uh, it was, I think Sh Shadow's deck was my sixth and Which I learned a seventh after that. Insane. That, that, that just befuddles the mind that you can know seven different, I, I can't even, comp my brain can't even comprehend that. Full um, disclosure, I, now I know Shadow's deck and that's it. Yeah, I, I don't think I could. I, I can still do the occasional card in, in Tamaris and Aronson. Um, I, yeah, I, I can just about do most of the Conover stack, but yeah, I'm, I'm sticking with Shadow stack now, um, partly because I don't need to. It was more of a flex at the time, and now it's, you know, I, I, I achieved my goal of learning seven stacks at once, and I demonstrated it a couple of times, and now I it's a waste of time. Don't do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, so really is, have you got any advice for people that are wanting to learn a mem deck and secondly can you still get shadow step because recall's not available anymore and for my in my opinion i'll tell you something right now i don't do shadow stack because i made the mistake of forgetting shadow stack i i, I learned it with you i did mm -hmm. it for about two or three months i didn't get it in long-term memory sure i then forgot it couldn't find my copy of recall you were blocked, couldn't ask you. Um, <laughs> so I ended up having to go to Mnemonica and now I do Memdeck Magic all the time, but I go and do Mnemonica, but I know from working with you on the Shadow Stack, that, and I, I'm telling you this, I know, I know you're a very humble guy, there is no better stack than Shadow Stack for a working professional magician because of what you've built into it. Thank you. And, the and there's even stuff built into the Shadow Stack that you built into it that you didn't even put on the DVD. I remember you showing me stuff and you go, I can't put that on there because it's not mine, but I've just built it in for me. I remember you talking about the David Williamson thing. The, yeah. The, the stuff that's built he, into he, Shadow Stack. That's actually a nice little Easter egg for anyone that happens to be watching that has the DVD. Uh, there is a routine in Williamson's Wonders called He Who Spelt It Dealt It uh, that we couldn't contact Williamson in time to get permission to use it. In hindsight, it gave us permission, but not important. Um, yeah, if you take all of the clubs, ace to 10, out they're in the right order to do he or spelt it dealt it just a quick yeah. aside so um, any advice on magic and can they still get recall or shadow stack or some version thereof um i'm gonna put a quick errata on what you just said in that i i think shadow stack is the best deck is the best memorized deck for me um i i think there's certainly more you can do with it than a lot of other stacks um but i would advise anyone when learning a memorized deck do your research um before you just commit to learning something like Tamar is just because it's popular. Um, but then again, I'm also biased as heck, so I'm probably the wrong person to be asking about that. Uh, but when it comes to memorizing it, I think, I, you know, what? I was given a tip by, I say a tip, it was something I came up with with my housemate um, a few years ago, uh, Liam Devine, who no, no longer lives with me, but he, uh, he was trying to learn a memorized deck and he was finding when he was learning the cards in order, so learning one two three four five he wasn't associating number five with the number five he was going through the cards in sequence you know he was learning one two three four five rather than five is this four is this two is this um so what he ended up doing was taking all the aces out and learning the aces one at a time you know, and he still used the flashcard system of having the the numbers written on the back. So you're you're looking at the numbers going right, forty one, four of diamonds. Um, don't use a marked deck for that. Bad idea. A hindsight's the wonderful thing. Um, but uh, yeah, um, by taking the aces out first and learning the aces. So in Shadow Stack, he was taking out two, six, eight, and twenty six, and then learning those. Then once he'd done that, put them aside, learn the twos. You know, learn where all the twos are in the deck. I'm not going to be able to do that one nearly as quickly. Uh, but yes, learning where the twos are in the stack uh, and then putting them aside, because that way you're not becoming dependent on the order. You know, you're not becoming dependent on the sequence. You're becoming dependent on the numbers, which is what you should be doing, because that way somebody can name a card. You know the number. Someone names a number. You know the card. Um, rather than if somebody goes six of clubs, you're going, right, ten of clubs, ace of diamonds, five of clubs, king of clubs, which is not at all practical when it comes to performing. Um, but yeah, so that that was a nice little gem that I wished I'd known when we were making the DVD because it was so simple, but it made a huge difference when it came to learning the stack. Um, when it comes to getting hold of the DVD, I don't know. Um, I would love to do something else with it, but I don't know where we stand with the rights to that because 
I I have a slight problem. And you know what? Solid. You can get some insider information here. Uh, Recall retails for £30. It's two disc set. Um, as a producer, as a creator, I get to buy a copy of that DVD from World Magic Shop for 40% of its value. So £12 a copy. After I sold out of my initial 100 copies that you get, plus £300 for the uh, uh, initial filming, which I still think is underpaying, but that's a, another story for another time. Uh, after I sold out of my initial 100 copies, I went back to World Magic Shop to order another 100 copies uh, for what, £12, so £1,200, right? Um, and as soon as, I, uh, as soon as I placed that order, uh, World Magic Shop dropped the price of recall on the website to £8 a copy, which meant if I was selling it for what I paid for it, I would be making a loss. Uh, so, because of that, you cannot get recall from me, officially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am on Facebook, uh, and my website is performingnerd.com. But yes, I cannot officially sell you a copy of Recall. Hopefully that answers your question, Craig. Hope you will. Uh, we move on. Um, that was that was that was a wonderful answer. So, two more questions. Insight into the magic creating world. Absolutely. Pull back the curtain a bit. Two more questions before we finish. Um, oh, first question, and this is just for my own personal interest because I think you should. When you were younger, you did a lot of competitions, magic competitions. Obviously, you don't say anymore because you don't consider yourself a magician. Britain's Got Talent? Um, yeah, I'm not against it. Uh, I'm not against the idea. I keep getting fairly close to doing it. Um, it's difficult. Um, yeah, it's. I'm sure most people on this already know it's It's never as straightforward as it looks um, on the telly. You know, it, it's never quite the bullpen of uh, the, the bullpen of thousands of people all turning up and queuing up to be in front of the judges um yeah i i keep getting close uh to going on it and then it all gets pulled at the last second um i think a bit of the problem is i would rather do it on my terms than on theirs which in the world of tv isn't how things work mm. so i'm i'm trying to I'm trying to find a compromise that works for everyone because here's the thing, like my, my producer, the guy that produces my Edinburgh show, um, he is one of the big producers that works with Britain's Got Talent and finds a lot of the acts for BGT. Um, he's, he produced Lost Voice Guy. He's, you know, um, tape face on America's Got Talent. He's, he, you know, he's a big, big producer, especially when it comes to the Got Talent um, franchise. And I would, I would, I say I'd love to do it. I've not, like, it's not something that I'm determined to do, but if the option arises at a point and a time and they are comfortable meeting some of my conditions, like I'm not, I'm not going full diva at this point, you know, I'm more than happy to play the game. I understand it is a, a structured reality show uh, in many senses, but it's um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm up for doing it. There you go. Sorry. It's a really long winded way of saying yes. There you go. I think, <laughs> I think you'd be a great fit on the AGT. You know, okay. The, the the whole the whole geek persona, you know, they they really embody that with the with the uh, Bing Bang theory and stuff like that, and and having a British guy, but you know, the, I think you'd really kill it on AGT. Interesting. Haven't thought about that. And they have they have acts from all over the world going AGT. I think that's true. Uh, I think. Well, that... I still remember when when um, Paul Zerdin won a couple of years ago. Mm. Uh, the, the the running joke all over social media was America's got talent, but they're just borrowing it from us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think AGT. Anyway, that that was one question. Mm. The other question is, uh, and this is something that I asked every single guest that I've had on this on this channel have been they've all been phenomenal, and I've always finished off by asking the the uh, the same question, which is what's next what's on the bucket list and and i know you don't like it when i wax lyrical about how much you've accomplished but i'm not going to do it. that i'm not going to do that again yes you again. are but i will say that your legacy is set if you didn't perform again like you say you you've done so much you've performed on the fringe you're fringe famous as you said you've done you've gone you've got to the pinnacle of the ships which a lot of people you know it's their desire to do you've released magic in the magic community you're you're magic famous a lot of people know you've done so much 
but you're so young. I'm nearly what? 30 now. Dude, shut up. I'm 44. Okay. Christ, you are old. Exactly. What's next? What are you wanting to achieve? Um, because I know so you're a, I know you're a big planner. I know that you're going to have thought about this. Not so much anymore. Um, I, I, you know what? I sort of I took anything that even vaguely resembled a plan back in March and April and more or less just threw it away um, because like we don't know where we're going to be. Um, and I think if you if you keep your goals pinned up at a time when the world is on fire. Um, you are just constantly reminded about how much you're not accomplishing at a time like this. So I've scrapped that for now. Uh, I'm working on myself. That sounds like such a pretentious thing to say. Uh, I'm I'm uh, working on a new act here and there. Uh, I'm also working on, you know, working as a radio presenter for a while, um, which to be honest, is something to do and it gives me a bit of structure and it also gives me that audience. You know, it, it makes me feel like I'm still performing. You know, it, it gives me a deadline. Um, personally, I want to get married in the next couple of years. Um, Emma and I are quite happily engaged, but we need to start planning a wedding, which we were going to start doing this year. Obviously, that's throwing that into pot. Um, yeah, just just to keep working, really, I think is my is my main my main goal at the moment. Just to get back on the ships as soon as it becomes available, um, because I, I I love working the ships. It's so much fun. Um, and you get to see the world, which is always a nice bonus. Although you do get to see the same places over and over again. Um, Danny Buckler made the point that, you know, if you'd have told me when I started working the ships that I'd be waking up in Barbados, looking out the window and going, oh, not this again. And then spend your entire day in your cabin watching DVDs. Uh, then, yeah, I wouldn't have believed you. But here we are. Um, yeah, I want to keep on working. I want to keep doing better shows. I want to improve. Um, the, the, the nice thing about doing the fringe is that it's fairly quantifiable um, as to how well you've done. Uh, so, like in my first year, I was in a sixty-seat theatre in the back room, well, sixty-seat room in an Italian restaurant. Um, the following year, I was in quite a nice theatre at a slightly inconvenient time, and then twenty nineteen last year, I was in a fairly nice venue right in the center of it all at a perfect time so now the only you know i can keep going up from there and hopefully bigger venues and keep selling out and who knows i mean i'm not holding out for telly but it would be quite nice at some point so we'll see and would you ever consider writing a book because you've you've learned you you've created so much magic and as you say you're never probably going to perform it again because you're moving further and further away with it as each year passes. And at some point you're going to forget how to do that stuff. Would you, would you ever write a book or do a, like a big project to just get all of your magic out that you've, that you you've created over the years? Um, I mean, I've certainly thought about it. Um, as I say, I'd, I'd feel slightly uncomfortable trying to publish too much on the close-up side of stuff, especially because it's been such a long time since I've done, you know, done it. Um, but also, I, so at the moment, I'm working on notes, I think is probably the best way to put it. Um, I am, I'm documenting the process of writing next year's Edinburgh show. Um, because in previous years, I've come away from the show that I've done and just gone, I am really happy with that show. How did I get there? How do I do it again? And I, I've been oblivious to any sort of creative process that I've gone through to end up with this show. Um, so this year I'm really trying to document it so that in future I can replicate it but also you know it might be something that we could potentially turn into a you know quantifiable step-by-step -step process for other people to write their own show that would be but, very useful yeah we'll see we'll see how it turns out but uh, watch this space but yeah I'm, I'm well up for putting together my magnum opus of you know every show I've ever done and character and scripting and yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's the thing. I, I personally, I, I get quite bad imposter syndrome and looking at my show, I see it as here is a thing that I made. Yes, I've had immense amounts of help from Matthew Wright and, uh, you know, uh, the chap called Tim Willoughby, who is an absolute genius, but he's more or less unheard of on the magic circuit. Um, and he is a phenomenal writer and helps me with scripting and story points and everything. Um, and I've got a, a great circle of friends. You've got people like Aaron Hayes and uh, Owen Strickland that you introduced me. And yeah, Owen. Yeah. Owen Strickland. Um, yeah. 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 And uh, uh, Tom Mullinger and 
loads of people along those lines who, you know, it, it is a, a combined effort. But I look at this show and think, here is something that I have made. It can't be that good. Which it, it is complete imposter syndrome. And I know, you know, there is no logic that everything was created by somebody, right? But yeah. I think a lot of magicians okay. get imposter syndrome. They really do. And the more successful you are, the, 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 the worse it becomes. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I go to the fringe and I, I convince myself after every, every few shows that at some point people are just going to start thinking, you know, at some point people are going to realise that I don't belong there. Right, that I, you know, I, I'm just gonna get the body snatcher stare, like, oh, uh, you know, like <laughs> he shouldn't, he shouldn't be here. What's he doing here, being all successful? Um, so yeah, which I know is completely irrational and, you know, isn't a thing. But, um, like, okay, 2018, I was not happy with my show. Um, I, I wanted to change it. I wanted to keep making rewrites and edits and, and tweaking it. And there was a whole routine I just wanted to get rid of completely. And I got a five-star review from a paper called Broadway Baby, which is a whole other story. Um, got this glowing five-star review and it absolutely made my day. I was over the moon about it all. And that night I said to Emma, right, I want to change this. I want to tweak this. I want to put this joke in. I want to get rid of this routine. I want to change this story point. I want to hit this. And Emma's just stopped me and went, Tom, it's already a five-star show. Don't change a thing. Save it for next year. And I did. And it just made, you know, just, <laughs> there you go. If I can recommend anything to people wanting to put a show together, get a fiance who will tell you when you're being a fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can relate to that. <laughs> that's amazing it's it's great yeah. seeing somebody that's achieved so much and yet be so open in terms of you know that that struggle it's great to see tom it really is oh no i think as you say it happens to everyone yeah it does i think it, really does. It, it happens to everyone and if if you're if if you don't think you're a little bit shit there is something wrong um it the whole uh, thing about the the dunning kruger effect right the less you know the more you think you know um yeah, I think there are lots of bad magicians out there um, that think they're incredible. Uh, hell, I was one of them, right, for the longest time. Up until I went to work for Rodney in 2011, I went out there thinking that I was the dog's bollocks and got out there and within a week realised, oh, actually, no, I'm, I'm nowhere near as good as I thought I was. Um, so, yeah, having someone whose opinion you value. Hell, you know what? It's it's why on a lot of the Facebook groups, I'm I'm often quick to... I say criticise, that's probably unfair. I think you get so many people posting videos on there that aren't necessarily as good as they can be. Um, and they're full of people commenting, going, brilliant, well done, yeah, oh, awesome performance. It's like, it's not, though. Like, it's it's really not. Um, and they've already had enough people saying how good it is. Right, I'm going to... And you know what? A lot of the time, even if it is good, I'm going to find something that could be better because being told how good you are doesn't help anyone. No. Other than your own ego, which the only way you can improve. I, I did a whole rant on this uh, a few weeks ago on the channel. I was like, uh, magicians need to start being honest with each other and actually say if something's terrible, you know, because yeah. you need somebody that you can go to that's not going to butter you up and is going to say, well, actually, that was a little bit shit. And, and here's the thing, right? If, if somebody tells you that it's shit, first of all, you need to look at it and go, is it shit? And you also need to look at the person that's saying it and say, do I value their opinion? And Hell, you know what? I, I don't care if every video that I comment on on, you know, magicians of Facebook or whatever is is someone that looks at that comment and goes, I don't value his opinion. It's fine. I won't take that into account. That's fine. Like, I, I don't mind that at all. Um, but I've said my part and hopefully they'll take it on board. And even if hell, I, I've had people, you know, critique my show and 99% of what they've said might be absolute rubbish that has no place, you know, anywhere near my show. But if that 1% is maybe, you know, don't move around the stage as much or have you thought about changing this word or something else that might actually change the show, you know, might help the show. Um, it's worth trying. So, yeah, there you go. There you, over. go. you know what, Tom? <laughs> It has it has been amazing having you on the on the channel. I really appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy. 
I really do. I'm really not over lockdown. <laughs> no, no, you got, you got, you're, you're a radio presenter, and you know you're, you're creating a new show and a whole bunch of other stuff. You are you are still a busy you are still a busy guy, and I really appreciate you coming on here. And I, I really suggest to any magician that's watching this, and I get so many of them asking about Rubik's cubes. Forget about buying this or buying that or buying this gimmick or buying that gimmick. Go speak to Tom. Get some lessons on to how to actually solve a Rubik's cube. That is where you want to start off before you go anywhere else. I really, really believe Always that. happy to help. And you were doing Rubik's Cubes before I finished this whole thing off. You were doing Rubik's Cubes before it was cool. I remember... They're still you... not cool, Craig. Okay. <laughs> Popular. <laughs> Whatever you want before to call it. they were popular. Yeah. I remember you and Thomas blowing me away with Rubik's Cubes. And this is before <clears throat> Cube 3. And, and anything else that came out. And this is, this is you know, back in the day, I, you, and, you and Garrett were... Just, blowing my mind it was well i'll be honest garrett was was more or less my influence for it all um and yeah and it was oh no i tell a lie uh annabelle de Vetten was the uh was the influence behind me doing rubik's cubes uh just a quick story because i know you wanted to wrap up uh and annabelle you know annabelle yeah, uh, tom, uh, tom peterson's uh, wife uh, better half yes yeah who amazing, now live over in amazing, la i believe amazing cake maker so before she was a cake maker, she was she was a, a an artist, just a straightforward artist, and she had all these amazing paintings, and she made the Jill deck, I believe, was hers. Hmm. Um, half the paintings that were up around Illusions Bar were hers, like you know some really iconic images in magic. Um, so she, I forget how we became friends. Anyway, she uh, offered to design me a logo um, for for my magic brand skip back about six months i was doing a photo shoot so i wanted some professional photos trying to build myself as a you know professional close-up guy and uh i was learning to solve a rubik's cube at the time just for fun just for my own sanity and i had it in my bag and the photographer said oh can we get a photo of you with a rubik's cube and i'm like it's not part of the act yeah but it'll look good in the pictures fine take a couple of pictures they look quite good annabelle when designing my logo wants a couple of photos of me uh, to base it off and i send her a couple of pictures including ones with the rubik's cube she sees the Rubik's Cube and goes, that's a great idea for a logo and comes back with this incredible logo, which I'm gutted I can't use anymore because it's just a little bit too magic-y. Um, but it's, it's just exceptional. And uh, yeah, she came back and uh, I started using it uh, as my logo. But I thought, right, since I've got the logo with, with the Rubik's Cube on it, I should probably actually use the Rubik. You know, I should probably put the Rubik's Cube in the show somewhere. Um, so I did. So it was, you know the wrong way around really they that that's the logo i remember that logo it's a great logo just perfect you know so yeah so uh i thought right i should probably put the rubik's cube somewhere into the show and i did so it's annabelle's fault annabelle she started all this started all this wow yeah there you go She's yeah there you go fun. there you go <laughs> tom you are amazing i uh like i say i'm gonna put your website down there performing nerd dot dot com Com. performingnerd.com go check out tom uh are you doing any more i know you did a zoom show over uh, over lockdown you kind of sold tickets to your your, your... oh yeah i i, are you I doing just another I, one of those uh no I, I put my 2019 edinburgh show up on i did a facebook live and just showed it for anyone that wanted to watch um uh, uh no plans to do it again um i i kind of i like the idea of it being a one-off mm -hmm. you know you, you had to be there sort of thing um yeah i i don't know watch this space i suppose follow me on all the socials and i'll shout follow, about it there if anything else is happening follow tom on the socials check him out and uh go beg him to uh teach you how to solve rubik's cube <laughs> no tom, begging rubik's required cube. dude rylan's really excited about his first lesson that's all i can say <laughs> um it'll be fun guys thank you so much for uh tuning in don't forget subscribe to the channel i'll be back tomorrow with uh the review show with rylan so check that out and um yeah i'll see you again soon tom thanks very much take care bye everybody